Good evening and welcome to MDFA's first webinar on inherited retinal diseases, an update for optometrists. My name is Mira and I'm an optometrist and the Healthcare Relations Manager with the MDFA. Before we begin, in the spirit of reconciliation, the MDFA acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respect to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. Firstly, some housekeeping. All attendee cameras and microphones have been turned off. If you have any questions, please enter them via the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. Your questions will be answered at the end of the presentation, but feel free to type them out at any time. The webinar today is a CPD activity and has been accredited by Optometry Australia for one CPD hour. The learning objectives for the webinar can be seen on the screen now and will be provided in the post webinar survey. Tonight, we are delighted to be joined by Professor Alex Hewitt. Alex is an ophthalmologist and the head of clinical genetics at the Centre for Eye Research Australia. Alex completed formal ophthalmology training at the Royal Victorian Eye and Ear Hospital in Melbourne in 2011. The following year, he was a Novartis Research Fellow at the Lions Eye Institute and was awarded a WA Tall Poppy Award from the Australian Institute of Policy and Science. In 2016 and 2018, he received an NHMRC Research Excellence Award for the Top Rank Practitioner Fellowship application and program grant application. His clinics at the Royal Victorian Eye and E Hospital and Royal Children's Hospital specialises in inherited eye diseases. Please welcome Professor Alex Hewitt. Yeah, thanks a lot for the introduction, uh, Mira. Uh, the um, seeing that picture up there of myself, um, I've normally been sharing a, a picture where I'm a lot younger looking and have no beard. So um, I guess that updated uh, photo from Sierra will be the new profile picture for me. Um, anyhow, this um, this evening I'm going to uh, give a quick run through about uh, macular dystrophies, um, uh, with a particular focus on uh, the genetics uh, of these uh, and how we can use that uh, genetic information to hopefully uh, uh, influence and and direct uh, the potential discussions and clinical consultations with patients with inherited retinal dystrophies. So the, the first big question uh, when it comes to uh, macular dystrophies is, you know, why actually identify a gene uh, associated with uh, their disease? And I think there are three major reasons. And the firstly, to understand uh, their disease. So uh, by identifying a disease causing variant in a gene known to cause a macular dystrophy um, allows us to uh, further uh, the understanding uh, of that gene uh, and potentially identify gene-specific uh, interventions. It secondly allows us to predict the likely natural history uh, of uh, the disease for that, uh, for that patient. And then finally, it uh, potentially allows us to uh, direct an intervention uh, specifically for that patient. So the, the next sort of big thing is, you know, um, I think it's important to have a, a concept of how complex our individual uh, genome is. And I find it mind blowing that it's possible to send, uh, to launch a, a rocket uh, and send that into space, have that land on an asteroid, take a sample from that asteroid and then actually return to Earth. So with that, you know, if we can do all that amazing things, you know, why can't we get in and treat some of these uh, inherited retinal diseases? Um, and the big sort of reason for that really uh, comes down to the complexity of the genome and the underlying biology. So your uh, individual genome is comprised of 3.3 uh, uh, billion nucleotides. And that is obviously what makes up your genetic code. And just to wrap your head around how big uh, your genome is, 
I think one of the best analogies is to imagine expanding each of your nucleotides, so each of the bases that make up your uh, genetic code, up to be the size of a matchstick. And then you, your genetic code would have enough matchsticks to span from the earth up to the moon, and then back down to earth, and then back up to the moon again. The, and then if you imagine each of these matchsticks is colored one of four different colors, um, representing each of the different nucleotides that um, obviously pair with each other. Um, it's uh, one way to conceptualize an inherited retinal disease um, is essentially it can manifest just because one of those matchsticks is either painted a different color or um, it has been burnt uh, or is missing. Now, obviously, some uh, inherited uh, diseases require more than one matchstick to be burnt. Um, and these are, you know, would be typically your autosomal recessive uh, conditions, um, whereas autosomal dominant conditions are generally uh, require only a single matchstick uh, to be burnt. So when it comes down to you know, why identify the gene, um, the first sort of section that we'll talk about is um, how this uh, identification of disease causing variants can be useful uh, for understanding and predicting disease. So uh, to date, there are over 200 genes that have been definitively associated with, uh, with the development of an inherited retinal disease. And what's remarkable with this is that there's dramatic phenotypic overlap uh, depending on what gene uh, a person carries or what genetic change is carried in that gene. And so here you can see these sort of overlapping uh, rings of different diseases um, with the gene names uh, sort of highlighted there. And I think it's clear that the further, the more we know uh, about the uh, disease uh, that, or the genetic epidemiology in our community, the better the, our understanding is becoming of the, of the dramatic change in, in uh, phenotypic spectrum. Um, and so here you can see that there's, you know, is certainly a number of genes where they can uh, manifest, for example, either just with Usher syndrome or an isolated retinitis pigmentosa. The, um, obviously, with a focus tonight on macular diseases, um, it's the, looking at those cone uh, rod dystrophies as well as the ABCA4-related disease, you can see that that can potentially manifest to uh, have a, a range of different diseases. So, uh, so again, sort of why is it useful um, to understand what the uh, genetic change is? Um, and one is to um, enable the, uh, the prediction of the likely natural history um, for that patient, or even to predict the likely transmission pattern uh, for an individual. And so here's a, a pedigree of a, of a family who we've uh, been uh, reviewing. Um, and the male here was uh, told that he uh, has uh, autosomal dominant retinitis pigmentosa. And this is the, the photo uh, of his uh, color fundus photograph of his, uh, of his retinas. Um, and you can see it's sort of a little bit atypical for a retinitis pigmentosa. And on genetic testing, he was actually found to have a genetic variant uh, in, the C, in the CH M gene, and obviously this causes choroideremia. Um, so this is actually an X-linked uh, inheritance pattern. Um, and so that would you know, obviously dramatically change the uh, what you would tell this uh, patient uh, about the prospect of their children uh, manifesting disease. Um, so obviously being an excellent condition, uh, none of his uh, male uh, offspring uh, uh, would uh, manifest disease. Um, however, all of his daughters uh, would be carriers and may well have subtle phenotype associated with that. As another example, uh, this was a, a, a patient who we uh, reviewed and his uh, daughter was uh, uh, keen to uh, consider family planning. Um, and so thereby uh, the big question for her was, you know, what's the chance of her uh, being a carrier and or manifesting disease? 
And so from the pro band here, the, the father of the daughter uh, was actually found to have a, a genetic variant in his uh, PRPH2 gene, and so the peripheral uh, RP gene. Um, and obviously this is inherited in an autosomal dominant manner. Um, so certainly there would have been a 50% chance that his daughter was a carrier. Now, uh, also by understanding the genetic changes that uh, uh, are occurring, it's possible to uh, predict uh, the likely uh, disease uh, course uh, for that individual. And possibly one of the big sort of exceptions to this uh, is actually best disease, um, that where genetic uh, variants uh, occur in the best trophin one gene. Um, and what, uh, from large sort of studies that have been conducted uh, here in Australia, we actually found that there is, can be marked uh, variation uh, in disease expressivity, uh, as well as uh, incomplete penetrance. Um, so even though individuals uh, carry a, the, the same gene in the family, that, that it is manifesting uh, with uh, bad uh, blinding uh, central macular disease in one individual in their family, um, even though they carry the same genetic variant in the best uh, one gene, they do not always manifest disease. So I think just having that as a little caveat um, in terms of that disease uh, risk prediction. So the next big question is, how do you go ahead and actually get uh, genetic testing organised? Um, and that is certainly something that is becoming a lot more uh, readily accessible. Um, and almost every centre in Australia now uh, has the ability to uh, undertake uh, genetic uh, profiling. Um, one issue at the moment is that it's not currently subsidised by Medicare. Um, and so if it's not going to be for a direct intervention, uh, then uh, then testing needs to be uh, covered uh, by another means. If a patient is going to pay for it themselves, uh, it would cost uh, generally in the order of about two and a half thousand dollars. Um, and generally, because it won't have any direct uh, uh, change in their clinical management, I typically don't advocate for a patient paying it for it themselves um, unless they certainly have the means to do so. Um, so the two sort of common companies at the moment that have sort of risen to the top of the pack are Invitae and Blueprint Genetics. And by and large, they uh, profile the similar number of genes um, and you'd get a very similar report back uh, from this. Um, the, interestingly, Invitae offer a genetic counselling service uh, as part of their uh, test. Um, however, Blueprint Genetics uh, currently don't. Um, so in terms of the uh, macular uh, dystrophies, I would, um, well, just taking a step back, in terms of uh, retinal dystrophies, um, so just randomly seeing a patient with a inherited retinal disease, um, I generally tell them that there would be a six to seven uh, out of 10 chance that we would be able to identify the disease causing variant uh, for them. Um, however, when it comes to macular disease, um, that likelihood of uh, being able to identify the precise disease causing variant in a gene that we already know um, is dramatically higher. And so this is uh, work from Ed Stone in Iowa, whereby he uh, reviewed uh, a thousand consecutive patients who presented to his genetics clinic with an inherited retinal eye disease. And when he broke down the subgroups, uh, he was able to solve, genetically solve, um, that means sort of actually identifying the disease causing variant that causes their macular disease in almost nine out of 10 patients. So if you have a patient with a, what looks to be an inherited macular, macular disease, there's a very high likelihood that we could actually make a genetic diagnosis uh, for them. So the next sort of big question is, you know, uh, how can we use that information to actually intervene and actually better guide uh, treatment? So when it comes to the uh, treatment or therapies, um, I think it's important to convey to patients that, the, that there's a lot of uh, research being undertaken at the moment um, across a wide range of different uh, modalities. 
Uh, and but always that you know obviously with research it's often two steps forward and one step back um, but progress is all is being made um, I uh, tell them that uh, each of these different uh, potential uh, therapeutic interventions is going to be uh, very uh, reliant or uh, of, upon where they are in their uh, state of disease so obviously, as they progress along the natural history of their disease, the actual potential intervention uh, is going to change. Um, so, and this is what you can sort of see in this sort of stepwise sort of chart here, that in the early stages of disease where there is uh, almost a fully functioning uh, retina, um, both uh, uh, anatomically and physiologically, um, it's, that's where the pharmacological lifestyle interventions are, are likely to sort of come to the fore. Um, and it's the, whereas conversely, it's the bionic eyes and the external technology, uh, which is clearly going to be necessary if there's no functioning uh, retinal cells uh, at the back of the eye. Um, taking a step back from all of that, though, I think there are uh, three, at least three uh, major things that should be reviewed in uh, every patient with an inherited retinal disease. And, and I've added a fourth uh, and a fifth consideration there just as, as a memory jog for myself. But I think the, the three main things that you need to ensure that a patient doesn't have, um, because these are the things that can be directly intervened for right now, uh, and they are the development of a posterior subcapsular cataract, an epiretinal membrane, uh, or cystoid macular edema. So any of those uh, three things obviously has the potential, you know, we can intervene for those right now. And so you don't need to be, um, uh, you, you can be optimistic uh, for the patient in terms of having a direct intervention that may well uh, help benefit, um, benefit them. Um, so obviously uh, the cataract with cataract surgery, epiretinal membrane peeling, um, or low dose uh, dimox. Um, just a note on that, obviously if a patient's allergic to sulfur, you don't want to be uh, prescribing um, acetazolamide. Um, typically the dose would be 125 milligrams twice a day. Um, th the other thing that I think you need to be um, uh, looking out for is obviously the development of a choroidal neovascular membrane um, that can occur in the Salisbury's uh, dystrophy. Um, obviously, Salisbury's dystrophy is a, a very sort of rare uh, macular disease. Um, there's only a handful of, of families that I know about in Australia, um, but obviously the key thing to monitor for those uh, patients are the development of a neovascular membrane because obviously there are anti-VEGF therapies that could be used for them. And then the final sort of note is obviously all patients with an inherited retinal dystrophy could have uh, ongoing support and uh, obviously through support with the NDIS um, and low vision services uh, can be intervened straight away. So for the last sort of part of the, of the presentation tonight, I'm just going to sort of step through some of the uh, work and uh, research that's been undertaken on each of these potential interventions uh, for these uh, for inherited retinal diseases. So the first thing is the consideration of lifestyle modifications. And generally on the whole, there's not a lot that could be advocated on this front. Um, obviously tell patient, any patient who's smoking that just uh, to stop that, uh, both for their uh, retinal health and, and health uh, generally. However, for Stargardt's disease, um, uh, which is obviously the commonest form of uh, inherited macular disease or inherited macular dystrophy, um, the, I think it's important to uh, tell uh, these patients um, that they should avoid uh, vitamin A supplementation um, because there have been good uh, preclinical studies uh, showing that high dose or doses of uh, vitamin A supplementation actually accelerates uh, disease. Um, similarly, I would uh, generally uh, advocate for these patients to avoid uh, sun exposure and so good use of uh, sunscreen and the like, uh, of sunglasses and the like can be uh, good on that front. Um, again, just highlighting a paper down the bottom there that uh, there is, we do now have uh, fairly uh, robust uh, genotype phenotype correlations uh, for uh, ABCA4 uh, uh, genetic variants. 
Um, and that's where, again, sort of just sort of circling back that it is possible uh, based on the genetic variants to give a better indication of the or better prediction uh, of that patient's likely um, disease uh, course. So in terms of the next sort of step on the ladder is sort of uh, pharmacological uh, interventions. And these can well be either sort of gene specific um, or sort of gene agnostic. Um, so I, uh, things that are specifically targeted uh, for a genetic change. Um, and so an example here of things that haven't reached the clinic yet, um, but, but for which research is certainly uh, well underway uh, would be sort of say the synthetic uh, vitamin A for again, patients with ABCA4 or Stargardt's disease. Um, and that's where you would have a very you know, gene-specific uh, therapy. Um, conversely, uh, the uh, nucuity and the uh, other uh, therapy, therapeutic interventions that have been developed, which are certainly uh, gene agnostic. So the next sort of, again, sort of as the disease progresses, um, the next sort of big sort of step would be the potential for uh, gene editing. Um, and on that front, um, the CRISPR has uh, certainly been the, the biggest advance that, that's happened uh, on that front. Um, and so the Nobel Prize uh, for uh, Medicine and Physiology a couple of years ago uh, was awarded to Emmanuel Charpentier and Jennifer Doudna um, for the uh, characterization uh, of the uh, CRISPR endonuclease. And essentially, this is a, a, a a system that's used by bacteria and archaea as an adaptive immune system to uh, fight off viruses. And essentially, this has now been adapted uh, to work in mammalian cells um, such that it's possible to uh, direct these endonucleases to any uh, site in the human genome uh, with very high fidelity. Um, probably the best way to think of these enzymes is just as a molecular pair of scissors. Um, and if you imagine uh, your genetic code as being the, uh, the rope uh, for which you know, this rock climb is suspended from, um, obviously, if you uh, cut the rope, the, uh, the rock climb would fall to their death. Um, and similarly, if you cut DNA, the cell uh, will die. Um, and so uh, the cells have uh, evolved uh, mechanisms uh, to prevent that um, and essentially it involves just rapidly trying to repair that uh, DNA break as, as efficiently as possible. Um, the big uh, issue is that occurs though as that as that happens is that often um, uh, errors, small errors at that site of the break are introduced and essentially that renders uh, the gene uh, non-functional. Um, and so that's uh, essentially how these CRISPR enzymes work um, in that they uh, direct the protein to uh, a target site and then the, the molecular scissors cut the DNA. The cell uh, then repairs at that site but doesn't repel it with very high fidelity and therefore the genes uh, become dysfunctional. Um, the, that as a first generation is you know, good if you want to knock out the gene um, and I render it uh, non-functional. Um, how obviously the, uh, the big aim would be to actually correct a genetic variant. And so to this end, uh, groups in both Japan and the US actually appended the CRISPR enzyme uh, with another, uh, another enzyme that uh, allows uh, different functions. And one of the first big sort of breakthroughs on this front uh, was the uh, the uh, adherence of a, uh, a of a deaminase uh, to the CRISPR enzyme, and so if you think back to the matchstick example, um, depending on the enzyme that's attached, um, it's now possible to convert, say, a blue matchstick into a red matchstick or a black matchstick into a red matchstick. And uh, shortly after this, uh, a different enzyme was evolved uh, that allows the conversion of a green matchstick into a black matchstick or a red matchstick into a blue matchstick. Um, 
And now there's certainly a range of different um, base editors that are readily available, um, such that it's almost like a cookie cutter um, methodology whereby uh, you can find a genetic variant that has uh, one of these direct sort of colors of matchstick variation and find the enzyme that would uh, best uh, correct that and then use that potentially as a therapeutic intervention. Now, the next sort of big breakthrough in the CRISPR uh, editing uh, front um, was again uh, undertaken by David Blue's group um, from Harvard, um, whereby rather than having a deaminase appended to the Cas9, they actually attached a reverse transcriptase and actually uh, adjusted the um, RNA guidance uh, of the enzyme. Um, but essentially what this uh, remarkable technology now allows is the conversion of one coloured matchstick essentially into any other coloured matchstick. Um, and so here you can see that it's obviously you know, very exciting because it's now possible uh, to potentially correct any small genetic variant um, in, the, in, the, in the genome. Um, so our research team um, based here in Hobart have done a, a, a fair bit of uh, work now on this. And one of the big questions was actually, how do you uh, fine tune and choose the optimal uh, sequence of the RNA um, to a specific disease causing variant? And so to, in an attempt to address this, we actually synthesized um, just under 12,000 uh, genetic variants that are known to cause an inherited retinal disease. Um, and uh, from that, uh, we made uh, cell lines um, and then actually profiled these using uh, next generation sequencing. And essentially from this, um, we were able to, at scale, uh, correct uh, many of these disease-causing disease variants, as well as tease out individual patterns of, uh, of the best way to program uh, these uh, gene-correcting uh, prime editors. And so that's certainly very exciting on that front. So again, uh, being optimistic to patients that you know, certainly a lot of work on the gene editing, editing front is occurring. Um, and the last sort of big milestone, I think, in this area will be actually how do you uh, generate these in a uh, GMP facility at scale? Um, and on that front, the Tasmanian Eye Institute has um, invested heavily um, with that and has uh, recently uh, established a GMP facility that will hopefully be coming online shortly. So the next sort of uh, rung in that ladder as, as a patient would progress on their uh, disease is on the gene uh, augmentation front or the gene uh, replacement therapy. And possibly the best sort of way to sort of conceptualize this would be that if the gene editing technology is where you're sending out a track repair team to an individual um, uh, sleeper on the track that's broken, uh, essentially gene augmentation just bypasses that whole uh, genetic change. Um, so, and so this is uh, typically uh, by uh, introducing a functioning copy of the gene um, and uh, having that expressed in the cells. And again, I'm sure many of you would have uh, heard about um, Lux Turner or the gene augmentation therapy uh, for RPE65. And this is you know, obviously terribly exciting because it was the first FDA approved gene augmentation therapy for any uh, human disease. And obviously there are now been patients in Australia with RPE65 disease who have been treated with this. Um, the one sort of big sort of caveat with the gene augmentation uh, therapies uh, is the payload. So these, uh, as I mentioned before, generally all uh, require uh, the uh, uh, virus to deliver the uh, correct or uh, non-mutant form of the gene. Um, and the major rate limiting step is actually how big a gene the virus can package. Um, uh, and so that you know, is an issue, um, particularly for conditions like Stargardt's disease, where the ABCA4 is actually a very big gene and doesn't uh, fit in the um, it, it fit within the payload of uh, the common adeno-associated viruses. 
Obviously, there are other viruses that have been explored. Um, however, they uh, have different issues with, uh, in terms of how many, you know, the proportion of cells that can be transfected in the retina, um, as well as the um, relative immune uh, issues that can develop from them. So again, sort of advancing along the, the disease, sort of thinking now about sort of bionics and cell replacement and genetic engineering. Um, and again, what, one way to sort of think about these things would be um, if you have that sort of defective part in that uh, train sort of network would be to actually bypass that and essentially build a whole new uh, rail network to bypass that genetic change. So on the uh, opto on the cell on the genetic engineering sort of front, um, the big sort of things on that uh, sort of optogenetics um, as well as C cell reprogramming. And so in terms of optogenetics, um, that essentially is if you sort of zoom into any sort of part of the retina, is that uh, in terms of optogenetics, you're essentially taking uh, a uh, turning a cell in the retina that is surviving into a different functioning cell and so um, essentially what you can do there if you know as the retina degenerates is that you could actually turn other cells um, into a um, into a photosensitive cell and so sort of shown here in sort of pink so are these sort of other photoreceptors or light sensitive cells and then essentially using a virus you could actually uh, turn the retinal ganglion cells uh, into photo photosensitive cells um, and there have been clinical trials underway uh, for that um, with a major report out of Europe last year which uh, showed some promising uh, signs on that front. So, uh, so that sort of covers optogenetics. Um, obviously, you could also uh, undertake uh, genetic uh, engineering, um, and that's whereby essentially uh, you're taking other cells uh, in the in the retina and actually uh, turning them into into a, a functioning cell. So, essentially, using uh, uh, transcription factors to reprogram. Uh, that cell to have to serve as a different function um, such you know for example you could uh, use these this machinery to convert a Mueller cell into a photoreceptor cell and there's a, a lot of exciting sort of progress on that front um, in terms of uh, cell uh, replacement uh, therapies, um, so as it sort of sounds, um, that sort of the big sort of breakthroughs on that front is obviously on the uh, stem cell uh, replacement. Um, and again, the um, major sort of target uh, cell of interest there has been the RPE cells. Um, the big sort of uh, attractive feature of them uh, is the fact that obviously it's a monolayer um, that it's uh, that they are easy to grow uh, in the laboratory and therefore um, easily uh, can and with surgical intervention fairly easy to transplant. Um, again, there have been some promising uh, early stage clinical trials uh, for RPE transplantation, um, and so again, sort of for the. the uh, central macular dystrophies such as ABCA4, um, it could be quite exciting to watch the progress on that front. Um, obviously, if uh, if you have sort of complete photo uh, photoreceptor degeneration, um, there are going to be other issues with potentially needing uh, transplanting these, and the big sort of issue there is obviously on the pre-retinal processing um, that's undertaken. Um, but again, I'd sort of be optimistic rather than pessimistic that, that work on this front um, will progress. So again, sort of back to that ladder, then the next sort of major sort of things to consider would be on the bionic uh, therapy front. Um, and this is, you know, uh, things that such as, you know, the bionic eye um, or the uh, exceptional uh, load sort of visual processing um, uh, bionic interventions. Um, and obviously Australia has sort of actually led the way uh, on that front and is uh, quite sort of exciting and certainly offers uh, promising sort of avenues for patients with very advanced disease. So uh, again, those sort of big steps all the way from pharmacology up to bionics are really sort of still at that sort of major sort of research uh, intervention sort of phase. Um, 
but the one thing that I tell uh, every patient I see with an inherited retinal disease is the fact that the one thing that I can guarantee will improve um, is the external technologies. Um, and so I give them, you know, the analogy that, you know, 15 years ago, we didn't have a phone in our pocket that can talk uh, to you. Um, you know, there are We've had a driverless car expo in Melbourne a couple of years ago. Um, so I think the advances that are happening, certainly on the external technology front, are dramatic and will have a dramatic uh, and major impact on their visual function and quality of life. Um, there's a number of uh, apps that are available, um, such as Seeing AI um, or Be My Eyes and Bindi Maps. Um, that uh, many uh, patients with low vision um, uh, certainly uh, advocate for. Um, so again, I'd be certainly very optimistic of uh, the technology that's happening on that front um, and that there are th interventions available right now um, that can impact uh, patients' uh, visual function and quality of life. Um, so that's sort of a, a rundown of where uh, the difference of technologies are and uh, potential uh, steps for intervention. Um, and I think it's important just to be able to conceptualise that um, for a patient uh, when you potentially see them uh, in the clinic, um, such that there's no point in talking about you know, potential CRISPR or gene editing technology if they have very advanced disease. Um, and conversely, um, if a patient only has very early uh, signs, then uh, maybe sort of uh, talking about stem cell therapies and the like is, is certainly not sensible. Um, just one thing that I didn't mention about on the stem cell front is that certainly um, I would uh, heavily advocate for the fact that there's no need for patients to travel overseas uh, for uh, any uh, sham uh, therapeutic interventions. Um, such that you know, if Australia has an outstanding healthcare system, um, and you know, if anything is proven to work, it will be um, available here. And I guess, sort of, finally, on that front, um, the as I sort of highlighted before, there's sort of clinicians in every major centre who are certainly experts on the inherited retinal disease front, and certainly would be very happy to. Um, to co-manage or uh, chat with sort of uh, potential interventions or genetic screening um, for any patients that you have. Um, and similarly, I'd be very happy to answer um, any questions or if you um, have any issues with patients um, who you'd um, like some thoughts about who best to approach, I'm very happy to try and um, answer that uh, for you. So that is the end of the didactic part of the of the talk and I'll just try and find my mouse again and stop the screen sharing. Um, but I see that there's been a few questions. Um, so I might sort of just uh, run through those now. Um, so the first question was from an and and it's um, how long does a gene testing process take and what does it involve? So uh, generally it the uh, from uh, initial uh, consultation um, through to getting a result is generally about sort of three months. Um, the and obviously that can be important if people are thinking about uh, family planning and um, pre-implantation genetic diagnosis um, or PGD. Um, so obviously I tell patients that they uh, cannot present sort of at eight months pregnant, uh, hoping to get uh, uh, genetic testing done uh, so they can plan their family. Um, so all of that obviously needs to occur if they are inter interested in going down the PGD front um, to uh, have all of that done prior to people becoming pregnant. So um, the testing itself, generally uh, people get a result back in about three months. Um, that can be uh, faster if we already know the genetic variant in the family. So if you're doing predictive testing in, in other carriers, um, that can sort of reduce down to, to a couple of weeks or so. Um, generally it involves uh, having um, initial uh, discussion with either a genetic counsellor or, or clinical geneticist or an ophthalmologist who's interested in genetics 
um, and then uh, from there, uh, registering a patient um, with a service, um, as I sort of outlined before, and then generally, um, Generally, uh, samples can be collected by saliva. So generally, a patient would be sent out a saliva kit, um, and then they um, they spit into that. Um, it's important to tell patients that we want um, that we want saliva, not sputum. So it's sort of you know thinking of lemon juice or um, salt and vinegar chips, um, and not sort of trying to cough their lungs up into the into the sample pot. Um, and then they secure that, send that off, and then uh, generally would have a result back in about three months. So then the next sort of anonymous question was, what diseases currently have treatment interventions? Um, and so hopefully I sort of answered that uh, during the presentation, but I think you know, potentially every inherited retinal disease could be intervened for posterior subcapsular cataract, epiretinal membrane, cystoid macular edema, uh, or if there's neovascular membranes, then you, all of those have direct interventions. The other sort of big intervention is on the vision support. So engagement with a, a low vision uh, team uh, can, you know, like Vision Australia or Guide Dogs, um, certainly all that front, you know, they have direct sort of interventions. Um, so again, I sort of, it's important to tell these patients that, you know, there is, are things that can be done um, and the you know most sort of potentially sort of straightforward of all of those could well just be you know re good refractive correction could have a sort of a dramatic impact for these uh, patients' uh, visual functions. But um, the uh, then um, the, the big sort of um, you know things in terms of actual therapies it's probably actually on the RP sixty five that we have uh, ready right now. Um, so then Romans asked, uh, do you need to I've just sort of missed that. Do you need to perform uh, the CRISPR treatment once on a patient, or would it need to be repeated? So the, the big um, appeal of the CRISPR-based interventions would be that you potentially only need to have a single intervention. So, i.e., you just uh, go in, correct that genetic change, and then uh, get that uh, the proteins out again. So the big appeal would be that it's potentially just a single uh, intervention to make that uh, genetic change. The, that's you know, potentially sort of converse to uh, gene augmentation therapy, such as um, RP65, Lux Turner, um, whereby it's possible that the gene therapy wanes with time. Um, so actually for the CRISPR treatments, you sort of have the other issue in that you don't want this um, potential pair of DNA scissors sitting in the cell you know, for the whole of that patient's lifetime. So you only want to sort of have it as a short active um, uh, uh, sort of intervention. Um, Esther's um, had a, um, are there, asked the question is, are there more inherited, inherited retinal disease in Tasmania than the rest of Australia? Um, and although we've got an active research team of that down here, um, the answer is no. Um, and that I think it's important to point out that Tasm uh, as our uh, community down here is actually outbred, uh, we're not an inbred um, population and to have a functional bottleneck of inbreeding, probably for the population size of Tasmania, we probably need to be isolated for about 400 years before we actually have um, uh, recessive diseases manifesting. Um, what review period do you recommend for inherited retinal disease patients? Um, so again, generally, uh, if they don't have any signs of things that could uh, need intervention, such as posterior subscapsular cataract, epiretinal membrane, or cystoid macular edema, um, then I'll generally sort of recommend uh, every sort of two to five year review. Um, again, depending on the age of the patient and uh, and the type of disease that they have. Um, the, obviously, if they do have something that may well require intervention, but isn't quite sort of bad enough to warrant that at that stage, then you may well shorten that review period. Um, the, then Vicky's asked, um, what could be the best possible visual outcome be in a genetic engineering and cell uh, replacement? What would the vision potential be good or basic light uh, and movement? So at the moment, it is uh, basic light perception. Um, so and uh, potential to uh, for crude navigation. 
um, the again, there's the single uh, report that I've seen uh, that was published. I think it was last year. It may have been in the year before, um, but that uh, patient uh, could sort of sense a, a bowl on a table. But that was um, essentially the uh, the best sort of outcome that visual outcome that they got. Um, Having said that, I still think it's very early days. So um, again, the more that we understand the biology uh, of the retina and the ability to engineer that, um, I think the uh, greater the likelihood that we'll have of getting better visual outcomes. Um, I think one of the big sort of issues that I sort of mentioned before was the fact that um, or the fact of needing sort of pre-retinal processing to occur. Um, and so, uh, again, as we better understand the um, trophic factors involved in that, the, the greater the chance we'll have of uh, molecular engineering that. Um, can you comment on the trials about to start at Adelaide Uni? I'm not actually sure, Robert, about what uh, trials you're talking about. Um, are they... Uh, but the Adelaide Uni was definitely involved in the NACUITY trial with Bob Casson. Uh, undertaking the uh, phase one clinical trials there. Um, but I, I don't actually know what trial you're talking about. Um, and then uh, Shabastin has asked about vitamin A supplementation in retinitis pigmentosa. Um, so again, the, as I sort of um, highlighted um, before, vitamin A supplementation shouldn't be used or advocated for in patients uh, with uh, Stargardt's disease but it certainly is something that has uh, essentially two big camps of uh, people for and against uh, in uh, the retinitis pigmentosa. It, uh, the eye actually fall probably in the camp of uh, no, uh, no benefit of taking vitamin A supplementation for standard retinitis pigmentosa. Um, the big reason for that is that there was from the clinical trials that were undertaken, that there was no uh, benefit from uh, in terms of visual outcomes in either visual acuity or visual field progression in terms of uh, improvement. Um, obviously, there was uh, some uh, ERG uh, changing changes that were uh, uh, sort of uh, suggested to be beneficial, um, but given that there was no functional uh, uh, benefit, I don't advocate um, for patients uh, having vitamin A supplementation. Um, and then uh, Gregory's just asked about who should seek out the synthetic vitamin A. Um, so the big sort of thing there, uh, Gregory, was the fact that it's the synthetic vitamin A, which was uh, being uh, shown in a preclinical model of Stargardt's disease that actually is metabolized differently to vitamin A. And essentially it's like a vitamin A blocker um, that then could potentially slow the rate of Stargardt's disease. Um, as far as I'm aware, it's not actually available uh, at the moment. Uh, in, and I'm not actually aware of the results of the early phase clinical trials that have been undertaken in Europe on that front. So it's more in terms of synthetic vitamin A for, uh, for Stargardt's disease, it's a, watch this space with interest um, and that can again just be a reason to get these patients sort of back in, in a sort of a two-year period rather than a 20-year period because there may well be an intervention available. Um, so that's it in terms of the questions but if there's any others out there we're obviously very happy to have them emailed through or um, popped in the box later. Thanks, Alex. Um, that was a really insightful presentation. And I think the emerging sort of therapy for IRD is a really exciting arena. Um, just before we finish, I'd just like to give you a quick overview of um, MDFA and how they are supporting you and also patients with macular disease. So by referring patients with macular disease, whether they are newly diagnosed or have established disease to the MDFA, you're ensuring that they can ask those questions about their diagnosis. We provide individualized support tailored to their specific needs and where they are in their journey, whether that is evidence-based education, resources, patient webinars, information on risk management, and the types of dietary and lifestyle changes that may improve outcomes. Feedback from our macular disease community has led to MDFA developing several different modes of peer support where people living with macular disease can share their lived experience. 
and we also assist them to navigate the often complex aged care sector and other government services, all at no cost. You can quickly refer patients to MDFA via Oculo or via our website e-referral form, and they will receive a call from our highly trained services team within three working days. And MDFA are keen to support your work. So for those of you with an interest in eye disease, you can subscribe to Macular Matters, our quarterly e-newsletter, which is a quick read and update of what is happening in the macular disease sector, as well as MDFA initiatives that may help you or your patients. We also have free CPD courses for optometrists on diabetic eye disease and AMD. In addition, we will soon be releasing a course for optometrists on inherited retinal diseases, so stay tuned for that. And finally, MDFA have developed new patient resources for inherited retinal diseases, including a national genetic counselling directory, which is accessible via our website. We also have a number of patient webinars coming up in October, covering topics such as genetic counselling, diabetic eye disease and assistive technology. So I encourage you to pass that information on to your patients. Thank you so much, Alex, for a great evening. For those of you who have found this webinar useful, I encourage you to complete the free and accredited courses through the MDFA website and your usual CPD providers. And lastly, you will be receiving a post-webinar evaluation survey directly after this session, and we would really appreciate your feedback to ensure our next CPD event is even more pertinent and useful to your practice. Many thanks again, and good night.